Hi, I'm Jim Covington on behalf of the Illinois State Bar Association. Today is August 2nd and I'd like to welcome you to this week's issue of ISBA State House Review and we have five bills that have been enacted into law in the last 10 days that we'd like to talk to you about. The first one is Public Act 97-827 which amends the Open Meetings Act. It was introduced by Representative Sandra Pihos from Glen Ellen and Senator Kirk Dillard from Westmont and it makes two changes to the Open Meetings Act. The first change, it requires an agenda must set forth the general subject matter of any resolution or ordinance that will be the subject of final action at a meeting. And the second thing it does is it uh, requires the public body must ensure that at least one copy of any notice and agenda uh, for the meeting is continuously available for public review during the entire 48 hour period before the meeting. And of course, uh, if uh, something happens that is beyond the control of the public body uh, and it isn't posted for the entire 48 hour period, that does not invalidate any meeting or action taken at the meeting. And that takes effect on January 1, 2013. The second bill is uh, Public Act 97-848, which amends post-judgment collection procedures in Illinois. And that was, uh, this. the genesis of this bill was a article in the Wall Street Journal about Illinois was a uh, home to debtors prisons and they were throwing people in jail for failing to pay debts and also for failing to show up uh, using the, the court as a collection agency. And it makes three changes to citations and body attachments. The first thing it does, it requires a citation to be served by personal service or abode service as provided in Supreme Court Rule 105 that must include a copy of the statutory income and asset form that is created by this bill. The bill actually creates a form uh, to use in this by lenders and creditors. Uh, it, the second thing it does is prohibits a payment order from being issued against a person unless the form was served on the debtor. The debtor has an opportunity to assert his or her exemptions and the payments are from non-exempt sources. The third thing it does is no order of body attachment or other civil order of incarceration may be issued against a respondent on a charge of indirect civil contempt unless the respondent has first had an opportunity to appear in court and answer after personal service or abode service uh, under Section 2-203 of the Code of Civil Procedure. Uh, this bill exempts enforcement by units of local government for uh, municipal ordinance violations. A more extensive review of this bill is in the June issue of the Illinois Bar Journal written by Adam W. Lasker, which more fleshes this out in greater detail. And that bill takes effect on July 25th, 2012. The third bill that I'd like to talk to you about is uh, Public Act 97-867, and it amends the recently enacted statute to allow family members to get the medical records of deceased family members. This was passed about a year ago, and there were some little glitches that didn't make us as consistent with HIPAA, which put the Federal Department of HHS in a position where they couldn't help enforce the HIPAA provisions to allow you to get these records. So this makes us more consistent, and it essentially does three things. Uh, with the proviso, though, if in a state is open, this statute doesn't apply. What the whole idea behind this statute, which was an idea of Mark Haskus, a former president of ours from Mount Vernon, was that you shouldn't have to be forced to open up an estate just to get the medical records of deceased family members. And if you open an estate, there's no need for the statute. The first thing it does, it clarifies that a handling fee may, may not be charged to a patient or a patient's representative under this act. The second thing is it requires healthcare providers to release information to a duly authorized patient representative under this act. And the third thing it does is it requires that a person purporting to be a patient representative under this act certify it to that effect under penalty of perjury. And that took effect on July 30th, 2012. The fourth and final bill I'd like to talk to, or fourth and not the final bill, is, power, is amends the Power of Attorney Act. It's Public Act 97-868, and that is introduced by Senator Kirk Dillard of Westmont and Representative Emily McCasey of Lockport. And it, there was a big rewrite of the Illinois Power of Attorney Act and the Healthcare Power of Attorney Act about 18 months ago. Some of the out-of-state uh, bigger financial institutions have all sorts of uh, uh, power of attorneys that are just for financial transactions and really don't affect 
the uh, protection of the ward and they did not feel it was reasonable or made sense commercially for them to be under this act since they were already regulated under a lot of other federal and state acts. So for where the health and the welfare of the ward is really not at issue, they did not think they needed certain kinds of um, uh, power of attorney agreements to be under the jurisdiction of the act. And so those excluded would be financial institutions named as an agent for any person if the agreement does not include a durable power of attorney that survives the incapacity of the principal. And that takes effect on uh, immediately, which would be July 30th, 2012. The fifth and final act I'd like to talk to you about is the Judicial Privacy Act. That's Public Act 97-847. That was introduced by Speaker Madigan and President Cullerton and it creates the Judicial Privacy Act that allows a judge to prohibit a government agency or business entity from publishing, quote, personal information, close quote, about a judge. Uh, it requires that the judge make a written request to the agency or business to trigger this protection. And the genesis and idea behind this bill is that um, certain times uh, judges are in harm's way uh, for the job they do, and it was, it was, there was a kind of a consensus, particularly after that uh, incident in Chicago involving a federal district judge family, that there's a certain information that shouldn't be out there if a judge felt his or her family safety was threatened. That takes effect on September 22nd, 2012, and we will see you next week. Thank you.